<clears throat> okay, these are um, unit five, day four notes, and they start on page 12 of your packet. And the topic for today is using the first derivative test to determine local extrema. So we're talking about relative extrema here. Um, we're talking about finding mins and maxes just in a certain little neighborhood. Okay. So the essential question is, how can I use that first derivative test um, to identify and justify the locations of local maxima and local minima? Okay. So um, let's first of all uh, talk about um, local maxima and local minima. So if we look at this function here, um, which is one fifth x to the fifth minus x cubed minus one. Uh, we can see we've got a hill here and a valley here and a plateau here. So this would be a local max. This would be a local min. There is no absolute or global max because we go up to infinity on the right side of this function here. And there is no global or absolute min because we go down to negative infinity on the, the left-hand side of the function. So these are locals. Okay, so whenever we talk about using a derivative test, that means if this is the function, we're looking at the derivative or the slope of the curve. So we want to use the slope of the curve to find local maxima and local minima and then justify it. So we are going to look at what happens to the slope of this curve, the derivative, as we approach these maxima and minima locations. Um, this green is actually a slope calculation. It, there's going to be a tangent line when I put this animation into motion. So I'm going to go ahead and start the animation. And I'm going to go ahead and draw the point of tangency, as you can see, as it goes across the function. That tangent line changes in its value for slope. There's a really big positive slope on the right hand side. And that slope fluctuates as we different have as we have different points of tangency, and then again a very big positive slope on the left. <clears throat> so look at what's happening as we're going past the local uh, past those local extrema. Okay, so <clears throat> as we're coming to this maximum here, we see we have a positive slope, and then as we get to the maximum, it goes to zero and negative. And the minimum, we start out with a negative slope, and then it goes to zero and positive. So as we're approaching those extrema, we can see that our slope is changing from either positive to negative or negative to positive. Okay, in the maximum case right here, we go from positive to negative. In the minimum case, our local minimum, we go from a negative slope to a positive slope. So we're going to continue to use that derivative number line so that we can see how those pluses and minuses are changing as we move across that derivative number line from left to right. Now, one thing I want to point out here, we don't have to watch the entire video, but let's look at what happens here at this plateau. We have a, um, at that plateau, we have a flattening out of the curve right there at the plateau. Okay, that point of tangency has a slope of zero. But if you notice, plateaus, at this plateau, we have a negative slope coming in, negative derivative, and then it goes to zero, and then the derivative goes back to a negative value. So we don't have that switching from positive to negative and negative to positive. So plateaus, while they are critical points because there's a slope of zero, they're not extrema. They're not maxima and minima because we're not switching our derivative values from plus to minus and minus to plus. Okay, so um, the first derivative test then says this, for a maximum, which is right here, and for a minimum, which is right here, if we have a local maxima, maxima is singular for maximum, uh, or excuse me, plural for maximum, um, we have a derivative of zero. We've, we've flattened out. We are kind of at a flat spot, um, in this case, the hill. And if we have a local minima, we, are, of course, are the same scenario. We have zero derivative. We have a, a, a horizontal tangent. 
okay? Um, but for our maximum, as we approach the maximum, we have a positive derivative. And as we go away from that maximum or pass through it, our derivative switches to negative. So the first derivative test says this, a critical point of f of x is a relative maximum if the derivative changes from positive to negative. So let's pick this apart, a critical point. A point where the derivative is zero is a maximum, it's a hill. If the derivative changed from positive to negative, positive slope to negative slope. And then conversely, a minima is a critical point. Again, a critical point here, this location where the derivative is zero. And it's a relative minimum if the derivative changes from negative to positive. So negative approaching and then positive as we've gone through that, that minimum. So that is um, those definitions of maxima and minima comprise the first derivative test. Um, and then of course, we, we, we talked about this just a second ago, this plateau here, we have a negative derivative coming in and a negative derivative going out. We don't switch, so that is not a critical, that is not a, uh, a minima or a maximum. It's a critical point, still has a zero derivative, but it's not a maxima or a minima. Um, and that's what that is saying down there. Okay, so the first derivative test for locating local mins and local maxes, the following test applies to a continuous function f of x if its derivative f prime changes sign at a critical point. Then the local relative minimum and the local relative maximum is located there. So what do we need here for testing? We need a continuous function and we need to um, find the critical points. So that's the first step. We're gonna identify or we're gonna find the critical points. Which means we're gonna take the derivative and set it equal to zero and then examine the derivative and see if there are any values of x for which it might be undefined. And then we're gonna classify those critical points by using our sign, our uh, derivative number line again, or our sign chart. And then we're gonna write a conclusion. We're gonna identify the extrema. Is it a max or is it a min? And we're gonna state how the derivative changes. Does it change from minus to plus or does it change from plus to minus? And then we're gonna say that is the reason why it's a max or a min. So let's take a look at this one. We have a function f um, given by f of x equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x. It has, and it has a relative maximum at x equals what? So we're gonna go ahead, a uh, relative minimum. I think I said that wrong, a relative minimum. So we're looking for a valley. Um, so that means if we're looking for a valley, that means we're switching from a negative derivative to a positive derivative. So I kind of call this the derivative dance. We're looking for a minimum, so we go from negative to positive. So if you kind of create that motion with your arm, um, it kind of reinforces that negative to positive is what we're looking for on the number line. Okay, so first we need the derivative. So we have to differentiate this. So that's going to be 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. And then we have to find the critical points because those are the points where we could possibly transition from plus to minus or minus to plus. So we have to set that equal to zero. And I mentioned it in the last class too. This is, these are these four steps that we are going to do over and over and over. We're going to get the derivative. We're going to set it equal to zero. We're going to factor and we're going to solve. So you got to ask yourself what factors out here. And the only thing that factors out is a six. So we'll factor that out. And then we have to keep factoring if we can, because we need to, we want factor pairs. We want, we want multiples, you know, we want, we want factors multiplied together so we can set them each equal to zero. So this also factors into x minus two, x plus one. And now we can go ahead and set x minus two and x plus one equal to zero. And we can solve, okay? So already we know that we are not going to have um, these as our answers because there's no way we can get a radical um, expression when we're dealing with these factor pairs. So we are going to set, um, we're going to go ahead and um, set up our derivative number line. And um, we know that two makes this zero and negative one makes this zero. So we're going to put a zero derivative at negative one and at two. And, um, and then we're going to look, we're going to start testing some values. So if we test negative two, that means you put a negative two here and a negative two here. 
and that's going to be negative times negative, which is positive. If we test zero, that means we have a negative, um, we have zero minus two, so we have a negative here and positive here. So that's going to be a negative in this um, interval. And if we test three, put in three here and put in three here, we're going to have positive times positive, which is going to be positive. And so if we want a relative minimum, that means we have to look for the transition from minus to plus as we go across the graph. So minus to plus transitions here. This is plus to minus, minus to plus. So this is where our minimum is. And so it's going to be at x equals 2. Um, the other thing we can do is, and this is a nice visual, is we can put arrows above here. This is going to be a positive slope, slopes upward then downward, and then upward again. And so you can kind of see that this is a max and this is a min if you smooth that out. And so that's a nice visual to reinforce that there's a minimum right here at, uh, at x equals 2. So that's the answer for um, example 1. So looking at um, looking at this question 2, it's, it's presented a little bit differently. So how do I answer questions when we have the derivative, but not the function. And really, the, the answer to this question is your life gets a whole lot easier because you already have the derivative, so you don't have to involve any calculus rules to find the derivative. So if we look at question two here, it says the function f has a first derivative given by f prime of x equals to x times the quantity x minus 3 squared times the quantity x plus 1. At what values of x does f have <clears throat> a relative maximum? So now we're looking for a maximum. So that means if I let my arm be my tangent line, we're going to take positive slope to negative slope. Okay. So um, again, that means we've got to find those critical points and we've got to set up that derivative number line. Um, so it's a it's a calculator question. We're going to look at it first with that perspective. So here I've graphed the derivative. Now we've had this a couple other times. Remember, this is the derivative which means that you're looking at, at slope values or derivative values. So my derivative is zero here and here and here, okay? And so um, now let's, so these are locations of possible, these are critical points. So they're also locations of uh, possible maximum minimum. So the first derivative says, the first derivative test says, how does the derivative behave on either side of these critical points. So uh, if we set up a derivative number line here, we know we have a zero derivative here and here and here, according to um, my graph here. And now I'm going to go ahead and annotate whether my derivative is positive or negative in those intervals in between those critical points. So let's start out here, way in the left-hand side here. If you notice, that region is up in the uh, second quadrant. So that means we have positive derivative values. So I'll put a plus there. Then we look at this interval from negative one to zero, and our derivative values are down here in, in the third quadrant, which means they're negative. So I'll have a negative there. And then this next interval from zero to three, zero to three, my derivative values are here up in the uh, first quadrant. And so those are our positive derivative values. And then this last interval from three out to infinity, basically, uh, we still have positive uh, derivative values. So our, um, our derivative goes from positive, po positive to negative. So this must be a max. And then here, from negative to positive must be a min. And if we go positive to zero to positive, that must be a plateau. So if we sketch in those arrows, we can see that we have a maximum right here where we switch from positive to negative. So because f prime switches from positive to negative at x equals negative one, that is the location of the relative maximum. So here is your justification for saying your ma relative maximum is negative one and it's only at negative one. The other locations are not maximum. So this answer has to be A. Okay, let's take a look at another one that's similar. Uh, that, let's take a look at the same um, question without the calculator now. So how do we do this without the calculator? Um, so 
so we, we have to do this now algebraically, which means we don't have a picture to find where this is equal to zero, but this is the derivative. So we are going to locate the, we're going to, we're going to locate those by setting that derivative equal to zero. And it's already in factor form, which is really nice, which means this is equal to zero when x is equal to zero. This factor is equal to zero when x is equal to three. This factor is equal to zero when x is equal to negative one. And then once we get those um, critical points on our derivative number line, then we can go back and do our testing. So we can test at negative two, which would be negative. This will always be positive because it's squared. So it's negative times a positive times a negative, which is a which is two negatives. So it's multiplied together as a positive. And I'm not going to test here quite yet because I'm not a fan of fractions. I'm going to test here, okay? And I'm going to put in one. So we have one times a positive times a positive, which is a positive. And then I'm going to test out here. I'll throw in four. So we're going to have four times a positive times a positive, which is still a positive. You can see we're getting the same derivative number line as we got before because we're doing the same problem. So the only thing I can conclude then is since there has to be a maximum, this has to be negative right here. It's got to be. Um, that's the, it's the only place we could possibly have a maximum and this question is asserting that there, in fact, one does exist. There is no option that says it doesn't exist. So I don't even really have to throw in a half if I don't want to, but if I did, I could say a half, a half is positive, or excuse me, negative a half. Negative a half is negative. This is going to be positive. This is going to be positive. So we know this is going to be this is going to be negative here. Um, so that would be a way of looking at it algebraically if, if it were a no calculator question. And this, in fact, is a no calculator question on the AP exam. So when we get into class, we'll go over the takeaways from this uh, from the note taking, um, and then we'll go into our guided practice session.